Um, okay, let's see if I can operate this. Um, I'm, we Dutch are not famous for our poetry, so I'm... <laughs> <laughs> we have movie. <laughs> so I'm going to play you a movie first and then continue with the rest of the <laughs> okay, that was the shortest renovation ever. <laughs> or reconstructional questions you can ask me later. Um, as you all know uh, or heard of, I guess, is that we were like this in this situation for almost 10 years. In 2003, our museum was closed for extensive renovations. Uh, one of the reasons was that asbestos was found in the building. The other one was that it was leaking and it was renovated so many times that it, it wasn't anything anymore. It wasn't a 19th century palace of art that it used to be. It wasn't a museum either. So that my uh, management decided that we needed a renovation to bring the building back to its original status uh, as it was at the ending of the 19th century. And bringing something back into its original status sounds easy, but it wasn't. It was Murphy's Law all over the place. It's from um, construction problems to getting a constructor to rebuild the building problems to bicyclists that want to bicycle through the building problems and so on. <laughs> so we were closed for 10 years instead of the original plan four or five years. And when I say we were closed, um, we weren't really. Next to the Rijksmuseum, there's a small building called the Philipsvleugel, and it was open for all 10 years. And you could see uh, the highlights of the Dutch art in the 17th century. And the weird thing is that everyone in the world seems to know that it was open, except for the Dutch. <laughs> so over the last 10 years, we had a, approximately a million visitors a year and 70% came from abroad. So it's amazing that only 300,000 Dutch persons visited their own national museum per year. And um, an entire generation grew up without a national museum and it has had all kinds of implications that I won't even go into. Um, but we now have to reopen not just as a building, but mentally, we have to reopen ourselves to the Dutch and show them who we are and what we have. And I love numbers, so I'm going to throw a few, uh, some numbers at you. Uh, we have a million objects in our collection, uh, 700,000 uh, works in print, drawings and photographs, uh, especially the Dutch, but most people don't realize that we are the fourth printing room in the world. Uh, only leaving the Louvre, the British Museum, and I think it's a Swiss, I'm not too sure who's the third one, but we are the fourth printing room in the world. We have the largest collection of Rembrandt prints, Goldschiers, a lot of famous prints and photographs and so on. 
Uh, we have 500,000 records in our collections management system. Uh, it sounds like we still need to do a lot of digitization, which we do, but it's due to, a, for all sorts of reasons, for instance, you have a cup in a lid and so on, and you register it as one object and so on. Uh, but still, we have a lot of uh, digital descriptions of objects, and we have 250,000 high-res digital images of our objects, and in a previous session, I heard that we can truly call them high-res, uh, they are. Um, they are way over a thousand by a thousand pix uh, pixels. Um, this is also one of the things that we are famous for. Uh, from the beginning uh, of digitization, we started recording all of our objects in the highest quality possible. And we have a very large uh, digital photo studio um, where we uh, test uh, all kinds of new uh, cameras and so on uh, just to see if the newest Hasselblad is the best on the market and so on. So we're also a test bed for a lot of companies to see if they can meet our uh, technical criteria. Um, we are a national museum and we have objects, not just works of art, but also historical objects from uh, tens of thousands years before Christ until uh, very recent works of art. Uh, but we are in the fortunate situation that we have 175,000 objects that are copyright free that we know of. Um, I can tell you a lot about this, the research we did on rights in our collection, uh, but the first one was uh, the easiest one. You know, you look for the dating of an object and anything before 1800, you're very sure that it's copyright free. And we made this selection and then we ended up with approximately 175,000 works of art. So here we had a great set, no copyright issues. Um, and then we matched it with our uh, high-res digital images and we found out that out of these 175,000 objects, we had 125,000, no, it's, sorry, it's the lot letter one. We have 110,000 objects that are copyright free and we could use them for open data. Um, there are also objects that aren't copyright free, uh, but that we know the artists uh, of and we contact them and they gave us permission to reuse their objects in the things that we are doing and I will talk about later on. So that's why we have 125,000 objects with high-res images in our new website and in, in our Rijk studio. Um, this is just some of the numbers and I forgot to put in some other important figure numbers. <coughs> Um, in our new museum, we have 8,000 objects on display, and in the Philips Global, we have 800 objects on display. And it's just to show, Michael was talking about the 10% increase, I, I'm very bad at math, but this is more than 10% uh, of the things that we show in real life that we show online. So uh, my first plea here would be that you can only show so much objects in the limited space you always have, and what about all the other objects you have? Uh, what do you do with them? Do you keep them hidden inside of your, uh, your vaults, your museum? Or are they precious to, and do they deserve attention to? And especially in our museum with all the prints and drawings, they are very uh, vulnerable. So we have to keep them stored as good as possible, but they are priceless masterpieces. So digitization for us is the best way to show them to the world. It's the only way we can show them. Um, um, Michael made some other very interesting comments. And one of them is that every, everything starts with the vision. Uh, I can say that I'm in the fortunate situation that I have a director who is very and visionary and has a very strong vision on uh, our collection and on sharing our collections. Uh, he stated that all of our, our work is about the images, it's about sharing what we have. And sharing on the internet for us is one of the most important things we can do. Uh, first of all, because we were closed, uh, but we're reopening tomorrow. Um, but also because people, not everyone can come to Amsterdam. 
Uh, we imagine that Amsterdam is the center of the universe, and of course it is, and you should all come, but if by any chance you won't be able to make it, then why would we stop you from enjoying the night watch, enjoying Holtjes, enjoying the Vermeers that we have, or even enjoying the chestnut of the tree of Anne Frank that is in our collection. Um, we want to share everything we have with everyone, globally. So if someone lives in India and won't, isn't <coughs> able to access our collection, then we are failing on this person. Um, and we, we think that art can inspire others to create art. This means that we're not just showing it uh, to show it, we're showing it first of all for you all to enjoy it, to look at it, to zoom in on it, to, to sit back and have a great time. Uh, but we're also showing it to inspire others, to create new art. And that's one of the roles that museums usually forget, is that they're not just a display uh, place, they're also inspiring people to be creative. That's why I love it when I see all these kids drawing in museums, and I hope that one of them will be a new Van Gogh. Van Gogh came to the Rijks Museum and looked at all the, the Rembrandt painted and paintings and was so much impressed by the way that Rembrandt put paint on, on, on canvas so different from all the other 17th century painters that he himself started playing with paint. So that's, that's the goal of a museum and that's what you can do on site but to a global audience you can do that online as well and that's what you need the internet for. Um, so. This is where we came from. We were so proud when we launched this new website. Uh, I'm sorry that it's all in Dutch. We are Dutch and... <laughs> <That's why. laughs> half of the room here is Dutch, so they can all read what it says, but <laughs> for the other half. This is our old collections website. We launched this one in 2011, so it's not even old, although it looks as old as can be. Uh, but we launched it and we, we were so happy. Finally, we, first we had 100 most famous objects of the museum online and suddenly we had the entire collection, 300, 400,000 descriptions online. And we were, yay, we've got it online now, we've done our job and everyone can enjoy. <laughs> and wow, you can really enjoy the Rembrandts here. And we looked at the web statistics and we found out that you know, I, I can't even remember what the statistics for the entire website were, but I know that this section of the website was visited by <coughs> 20, 30,000 people a month. And the ridiculous thing is that in this box, it said, enter search phrase here, and that was actually the most used search phrase. People didn't know what to enter, so they pressed the enter button and that's how it became the most important search answer, <laughs> search question. <laughs> so we realized that we were failing on the Dutch and the global audience we wanted to uh, serve. And we went back to the drawing rooms. And this is what the Rijks Museum website looks, uh, looks like now. Um, we put the images uh, up front, and this of course created a big institutional row, row because um, we all work very hard to enter metadata and describe objects and someone else takes the pictures so it is something mentally to deal with when suddenly the image is here and your information is here, the things you worked on. But this is something people want to look at and the reason why we put high res images online is because you can zoom in. You can see the ends on the painting. And you can zoom in on every picture we have online. And I have to be honest, uh, a week ago I finally saw this picture in real life, because it's now hanging in my museum, and I was disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see the ends, because there's a crack in front of it. So. You can't see them. I can see them online and I can't see them in real life. So, please everyone, put your high-res images online. Some of them are better than the original works of art. <laughs> I, 
I don't think the artist will be thankful, but <laughs> at least we now know he, he painted ants on his roses. And the thing is, what we redesigned was the entire search on the collection. Um, of course, a lot of my more library-like and my more scientific colleagues are missing the old search possibilities. But as, you ha as in Google and so on, we simplified the search and put the images first so people don't have to know that we use Rembrandt, comma, and then um, uh, his first name, I wanted to say Vincent, but that's Go, comma, Vincent Van. But if you're Belgian, <laughs> it's Go, Van, comma, Vincent. So if you don't know these things, at least you can find uh, these painters and these paintings now. You always get results on our collection site, and we built in something that is very nifty and no one can find it yet, but I think it's one of the coolest features we have, and that is that you can search by color. And it's really amazing, if you look for red and start continuing and refining on red, you find amazing works of art that I wouldn't have words for, I wouldn't know it was in our collection. For instance, all these Japanese prints that we have, I can find them by searching on colors. I can't find them by using words. Um, so I'm also hoping that in the next iteration we'll implement searching on, on forms or on material decoration and so on. I know the technique is out there and it's, it's evolving so rapidly that it can really help us to search and, and see and browse without knowing the words of the museum, without knowing what someone else described it and just, you know, following your, your gut feeling and enjoying it and wandering <laughs> through collections. Um, so this is the collections part. Um, but we, we didn't just want to redesign the search so you can find nice objects. Uh, we wanted people to select and share and do everything with our works of art. And we were really inspired by Pinterest. Um, so. Well, you may de recognize the design here. Um, but the cool thing is you can, you can uh, upload an object from our website to Pinterest, and a lot of people do that. But most people create their own pin boards or their own Pinterest on our own website. So people really like showing us what they found in our collection. And this is so cool because people find the most amazing things. Um, you know, I always say I'm not in it for the, for the, for the night watch. You all know the night watch. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this job for all the other works of art that we have that aren't as famous and that need, to be, that need an audience to enjoy them. And what you see on this right studio, in, in three months' time, there are 4,000, almost 45,000 right studios created by people. What you see is that Everyone has its own interests. Um, it has winter, uh, people doing something, music. Uh, there's a lot of boards people create about flowers. Uh, some people like this nice lady, she created I don't know how many boards. Uh, one person creates one board and another one, you know, hundreds of boards. We even had a problem with a, a scholar, a, a scientist. Uh, she created the board and she called it uh, I, I don't know, she was doing research uh, to someone like Caravaggio, I, I don't know who. So she created a board called Caravaggio. And she put in a print of someone else, not Caravaggio, but just for comparison reason. And she was doing it in her evening just for fun. And then the next day, someone emailed her, Oh, you discovered a new Caravaggio. <laughs> and she panicked and she called us. She said, oh, you need to take it offline because, you know, it, it started, I'm starting a row here. <laughs> So people use it for all kinds of reasons and it, it's a very popular module that we have on our new website and it, it also helps us, I mean, these are some of our highlights here, of course, you know, these works of art, but for instance, this print, things like that pop up in every collection, so there's always someone finding something uh, in our collection that we, ha although we work in a museum, we had never seen before. And um, I try and find works of art in, uh, online that haven't uh, had a like yet, and it's getting more and more difficult because people can also like our works of art, and it's amazing. Uh, they know to find every work of art we have and like it. So 
I, I challenge you all to find works of art that haven't <laughs> had a like yet. Oh, you're waving at me already. And I'm going to start talking really fast now. Um, we also challenge people to do something different with our collection, to really recreate, uh, to really create new collections and reuse our objects. Um, the most famous one is, is a piece done by uh, Droog Design. I don't know how you, uh, how you know them in English. Um, and they used one of our paintings to create a stick-on uh, tattoo. And I can tell you, I, they, we run out of them. I took them to one conference and all of my museum's colleagues went home with a nice big piece <laughs> on their arms or backs. So. Um, but this is a great story too. This is a lady and she found, she's a, an artist and she found pictures uh, of playing children in our photo collection. And she started combining them all and created this necklace. And she has a web blog, uh, it's in Dutch, so I didn't put it in here, uh, where she describes how each individual work of art inspired her to create this one. And she sent it to us, and it reminded us of the fact that we ask people to be creative, but we don't have an upload module. So our next iteration is going to be that there's going to be an upload module, so we can have a new collection of the things people build with our collection. Um, and we started 3D printing with it. This is in a Dutch uh, um, magazine, um, a Dutch uh, a store, big store. And we sat there with shopping people and they started uh, 3D printing parts of our collections. And this is one of them, it's a house from a print and we cut it out of plastic. And this was just a fun experiment, but I hope over the next year we will start doing more experiments with it because people really like the process of selecting someone and something and seeing it appear in front of their eyes. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the really cool 3D printers with all the colors, so hopefully next year we will get, we will get hold of these kinds of things and really start sampling and creating new collections with them. Um, so. Uh, I'm really gonna. This is something you may already heard of. Uh, the Rijksmuseum also has an API with the open data, so everything that is uh, open and in public domain, uh, you can download the technical information. There's a URL with the online images in it, and app builders and programmers and so on can use it. And whatever is in there is under a CC0 license. Um, also on our uh, on our website, you can download every image. Uh, and it's, uh, if it's all for free, you can take it and do with it whatever you like. Uh, although you have to state that you're a private person, this is some internal twist we had over this. Um, so, um, what are the results? Well, the results are that we got a really nice apps. I think it's 20 so something apps. And it's really nice what people do with your collections. Uh, some of it you would never guess. There's one that used Facebook facial recognition software on our collection and has made a, a nice Facebook of all the faces in the collection of the Rijks Museum. It's hundreds of thousands of faces. Uh, and you can pick a face and then get the painting uh, that that face is painted on. And I can imagine all kinds of cool things we could do with this app. Um, so it's nice, but uh, some of my colleagues says it's not... Um, the Columbus egg, I don't know what the English equivalent is, it's not uh, as groundbreaking as we had hoped yet, although I hope that you will all hack us and create something really mind-blowing <laughs> with our API. Uh, but it, it created something of a buzz, and it, the buzz is really good for us, because the buzz, uh, I wanted to, if someone is interested about licensing and so on, and I'll go back to that, uh, the buzz is that others picked up on our open data, for instance, Europeana, uh, the Getty Museum, Art Store, uh, Google Art, and so on. So now with our API, we are able to automatically upload our collection to a lot of the big portals out there. And this means so much exposure to our collection because it's all in Dutch and we are famous, especially right now. Uh, but for instance, Europeana, uh, it has a much bigger audience than we have, so we are one of uh, their nice partners because we have all our high resolution images on Europeana and they generate such a big audience to our website. Um, 
they are our number three referral partner and uh, people that come from Europeana to the Rights Museum website stay on our website for an average of 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so it's, it's really quality audience. Uh, number one referring partner of course is Google and number two uh, is Facebook, our own uh, Facebook website, Facebook site generates a lot of audience. Uh, and I hope that in the future Wikimedia, Wikipedia will be our number three or number four referring partner too. Um, and coming back to, in my last minute, to some of the slides I skipped. No, technique is failing on me again. Um, I've heard some people uh, talk or ask today what happens if you put your images online high res. Uh, won't people steal your images? Well, this is our reality. They've done it, been there, seen it. I mean, there's nothing to protect for us anymore. Our highlights are on the internet. And the, we, I always show this Google photo um, because I always ask, do you know which one is the real milkmaid? <laughs> <laughs> so it's out there, everyone is doing it, and it is such a difficult situation for a museum to get your image and the correct, uh, uh, the correct, uh, I don't, can't remember the English, to get your image somewhere up here so people know that you have this original picture in your museum. Um, that's one of the reasons why we put all of our high-res images online. It is to get our most important works of art here because this is the one people will click on. And if school children are making uh, a report, we want them to use our image. So we prefer them to download our high-res image and use them in their report instead of getting it from somewhere else and getting the ugly yellow images. And then before you cut me off entirely, <laughs> I'm going to show you this one. This is even worse. Um, and it's, it's worse on this screen too. I asked a group of civil servants uh, which one is an original and which one is a copy. And usually they point at this one. They say that's original because it looks old. Yeah, that's because it's a copy. Uh, this is the original work of art. So people are not only stealing our images, they are abusing them and putting the most horrible things online. You can buy this one for 60 euros. So, and they have a running website, and it's alive for two years now, so they must have a business plan there that we don't have with the more beautiful image. So, I, I prefer to put our images online for free and have people have a good quality image in their living room and print it at a copy shop than getting it somewhere else. And I'm going to finish with this one, because this is China nowadays. They uh, missed an animation. I'm really going to run over time now, but... <coughs> okay, now I, I will show, if you're interested, I can show it later on. In China, there's a website called Fine Art of China. Please Google it and see if your collection in, is in it, because I bet it is. <laughs> and they repaint it, and they have a nice video of how they repaint your work of art. And they are very nice, because they state this work of art is at the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. Thank you, and they are selling it they're free, shipping it for free to all over the world. <laughs> so I'm, I'm digitizing and putting everything online that we have uh, to block this kind of bad copies of our collections and to promote all the works of art that aren't repainted in China. Because if the Chinese aren't interested in your collection, then they really get forgotten and people don't know that they exist. <laughs>